Good morning, and welcome to Aldersgate Online. Uh, it's been a beautiful morning, and we've had a lot of time this morning because of the time change. I don't know what you've been doing this morning, but I woke up at the same time that I usually do, and I just thought, what am I going to do with all this time? We finally get to worship. I actually went on a jog this morning, and uh, it's been a beautiful morning. Great to have you. Great to see the names already popping up. Please let us know uh, where you're worshiping from. Uh, it's always great to see the names pop up and, and the greetings with exclamation points and emojis. Uh, let us always on, on uh, these gatherings continue to lift up praises, blessings, uh, prayer concerns, things that are on our hearts this morning. Uh, for me, I'm just so glad I, I looked a couple days ago to see the evacuation map from the fires and it was all green. That was really nice to see it all green. And uh, we continue to pray for the first responders, continue to thank God for uh, their work this past week especially. And uh, we also, on this day, as many celebrate Dia de los Muertos and All Saints Day, we remember our loved ones and give thanks to God for them and the saints that have gone before us. Well, let us go to God in prayer as we offer this worship to him today. Dear gracious God, we do thank you for gathering us here together in our various spaces, wherever we are. We thank you for being the one true God that covers all of us, that unites our hearts and draws us closer to you this morning. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit, and bless this gathering that we might remember and give thanks for our dear loved ones who have gone before us, that we might remember the ways that brought life to others, even ourselves, that we might remember your ways, O oh God, that continue to give us life and draw us closer to you and bring your kingdom near to us. We ask for your blessing upon Pastor Tim, upon Lynn, all those who lead in worship this day, that we might truly experience your goodness once again. Help us all to be good soil for your good, life-giving word today. Come, Holy Spirit, for you, we offer this worship. In your holy and precious name we pray. Amen. Good morning. From the United Methodist Hymnal number 709, come let us join our friends above. Let's see for now. 
Amen. I want to share a few announcements with us on this Sunday. Uh, once again, thank you all for the generous giving that our church family has been able to lift up and offer, especially to the gift cards that we've been able to provide for individuals who are in need during this time. Just want to say thank you again for your generous giving and for the ways that you have supported our church family and the vision of So Nobody Walks Alone, the ways that your giving is enabling our church to truly uh, help individuals walk with God, walk with others, especially during this time. Um, just want to highlight a couple things uh, that you might not know. Our church is a voting center. Uh, started this past week and will go through November 3rd. So if you'd like to drop off your ballot or, or vote here, uh, you can come during the hours. There is no drop box here after hours, but during hours you can bring your ballot and you can vote here. And so we are grateful that we can just host uh, this gathering and enable, offer our facilities for this great purpose as well. Uh, something else that we are starting this Wednesday is the class to help us get through this pandemic. It's the class offered by Cindy Ellington, hearing God's voice louder than our angst, coping in COVID times. And this is for all age levels, the youth, uh, young adults, adults, it is catered, it's, it's prepared for all age levels. So um, just want to invite everybody to come and join us Wednesday night. It's a Zoom link, so feel free to let us know if you'd like to attend this class. We can send you the Zoom link, uh, direct message us, or uh, let the church office know, okay? Uh, it should be a very helpful gathering. Um, once again, just want to continue to invite us to share the things that uh, are blessing us. It is very difficult in many ways for us to make personal contact with people during this time, but you yourselves are able to reach out to your friends and share the different uh, content on Facebook that we are providing, and that is one way that we together can bless those around us. Well, let us continue in worship with the gift of music. There is not an All Saints Day that goes by that I don't want to sing this song, either as a choir anthem, which I dearly love, and I can, I can hear the choir voices in my head even now, or as a hymn with all of you. And so, if you're at home and want to sing along, I know it's in your hymnal, it's for all the saints.
Hallelujah. Thank you, Lynn, again. Um, on this All Saints Day, we do want to lift up the names of our church members that have passed this past year and the names of those that you all have provided for us to name during this moment. And so I am going to go ahead and lift up the names. And after each name, uh, Lynn will go ahead and uh, sound um, a bell to remember their life. And then after all the names are read, we will join together in saying, absent from the body, present with the Lord. So I want to name these names and give thanks. And as we name these names, if uh, we were in the sanctuary together, uh, if you knew this individual, we would stand at this time um, after each name is read. But since we can't do that, go ahead and either press the heart emoji or the care emoji or, um, or the like emoji, however way you'd like to simply respond and honor each one of these names as we lift them up. Harold Walters. Angie Triantis. Howard Gary. Jim Strapping. Ben Thomas. Danny Zollers. Norma Bishop. Pat Rexroth Parsons. Elaine Craig. Jane Meyer. Gloria Faye Truman. Ray Roethlisberger. Ilsan Choi. Moala Makakao Faki. Jim Friet. Carol Herman. Donald Anderson. Walker Hicklin. H.B. Hardin. Stephen Smith. Charles Fowler. Diane Olding. Margie Eastus. Lynn Goody. Sherry DeLong. Romeo Sequinzium. Erlinda Punong Bayan. Max Robert Gonzalez. Dr. Prasad Myler. Dennis He. Ray 
Barbara Kanyo. Reverend David Okariki. And Reverend Bill Usher. And let us say together, absent from the body, present with the Lord. Let's say it again together. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. Let us pray. Dear gracious God, we name these individuals and other individuals that are on our hearts this day. And from the depths of our hearts, we want to say thank you. Thank you for the ways that they showed us and gave us life. Help us, O oh God, to remember the hope that is in you. Help us to carry on the legacies that they have left with us that we may truly follow in their footsteps as they followed in your footsteps, O oh God. And Lord, remind us of the eternal hope that we not only hold, but we carry with us and hold out to the world this day. As we lift up the prayer that you have taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Our scripture lesson today is from the book of John, chapter 13, verses 1 through 17, and I will be reading from the New Revised Standard Version. Now, before the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour to come had come to depart from this world and to go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The devil had already put it in the heart of Judas, son of Iscari Simon Iscariot, to betray him. And during supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, got up from the table, took off his outer robe, and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into the basin and began to wash his disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was tied around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered, you do not know now what I am doing, but later you will understand. Peter said to him, you'll never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no share in me. Simon Peter said to him, Then, Lord, not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, One who is bathed does not need to wash except for the feet, but is entirely clean. And you are clean, though not all of you. For he knew who was to betray him. For this reason he said, Not all of you are clean. After he had washed their feet, he had put on his robe and had returned to the table, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example that you also should do as I have done for you. 
Very truly I tell you, servants are not greater than their master, nor are messengers greater than the one who sent them. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Good morning. Connect, grow, serve. We're passionate about that as a church. It's at the heart of our vision. We want folks to connect, grow, and serve. So here's a question I have for you. How has the pandemic impacted your ability to connect, grow, and serve? In particular, which of these three, connect, grow, or serve, has been the hardest for you to do during the pandemic? I want to invite you to share with us your response to that question in the comments. During this pandemic, which of these three, connect, grow, or serve, has been the hardest for you to do? Well, I think we would all agree that the, the pandemic has clearly impacted our ability to connect. We can no longer gather as we are used to gathering. But I think it's also made it hard to serve, right? Uh, several members of our church have told me, I want to volunteer for this, but my kids won't let me. Don't you dare. And in fact, some of you have gotten in trouble for serving. You were part of that cleaning project, you should have stayed home. Now, this is particularly true for folks who are older than 65, but even for young folks, it can be hard to serve in a world of social distancing. Uh, I think of the service projects that our youth group is not able to do. I think of college students who are doing class online only right now some of whom are spending the bulk of their days in a room staring at a computer screen. That makes it hard to serve, right? How do we care for others? How, how do we look out for the needs of others when most of our day is spent alone and online? It's challenging. Today, we're starting a new series on stewardship, and a steward is a manager. So stewardship simply means, how are we managing the resources that God has given us? God has given us time. God has given us gifts and skills. God has given us money and possessions. How are we using these resources to honor God and bless others? How are we using these resources to serve? And this morning, as we begin this series, I want to explore the question, why is serving so significant? Why is it so vital that we serve? Why not just connect and grow and stop there? And to explore this question, we're going to unpack John 13, which we just heard. And in doing, so, in doing so, what we discover about serving in this passage might just surprise us. In the society of Jesus' day, washing someone's feet wasn't a sought-after task. It was a lowly, degrading task. In fact, according to some sources, so degrading that, that Jewish servants didn't even need to do it, only Gentile slaves. Now at the time, maybe you would see a wife washing her husband's feet, or a child washing his parents' feet, or a student washing her teacher's feet, but never the other way around. It was unthinkable for those of a, a higher social status to wash the feet of those beneath them. But that's exactly what Jesus does. He gets up from the table, 
takes off his outer robe so that now he's, he's dressed as a servant. He ties a towel around himself, pours water into a basin, and starts washing his disciples' feet and then drying them with his towel. Now, according to John's Gospel, the invisible God is made visible in Jesus Christ. Jesus is God up close and personal. So what is God like? You see that person over there stooping down, washing their feet? That's what God is like. Wow. The God revealed to us in Jesus Christ is a God who washes smelly feet. Can you imagine your parents washing your feet? Your friend washing your feet? Boss, teacher? How about the governor of California? Can you imagine the governor of California washing your feet? How about the president of the United States? How about the God of the universe? Here is the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, and he is stooping down and washing feet. And let's get this straight. This is not a, 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 a novelty act for Jesus, right? It's not out of character. It's, it's not a, a publicity stunt for Jesus. This act of washing feet captures the essence of who Jesus is and what he does. This act summarizes Jesus' life and death. In Luke's gospel, Jesus says, I am among you as one who serves. In Mark's gospel, Jesus says, I came not to be served, but to serve. Jesus serves. Jesus reveals the heart and character of God, which means God serves. If God had a car, God would have a bumper sticker on it that says, I'd rather be serving. In Acts 17.25, we find these words. God is not served by human hands, as if he needed anything. Rather, God himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. Isaiah 64.4 says, Since ancient times, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you who works for those who wait for him. In Jeremiah 32, 41, God says, I will rejoice in doing them good with all my heart and soul. God wants nothing more than to work for our benefits, to serve us, because this brings God absolute joy. When Jesus takes off his outer robe and washes feet, he reveals God's inner heart. The God made known to us in Jesus Christ isn't a God who looks out for himself, but a God who serves others. God finds life in giving his life away for the good of others. God serves us. Hmm. I still remember when I first grasped that God serves us. I was in college. In all my life, I had heard how we are to serve God. But then one day, I heard that God serves us. And at first, I was offended. I thought, well, that's degrading to God. But the more I looked at Jesus and studied the Bible, the more I realized it's true. God serves us. God is the greatest servant in the world. This discovery changed my view of God. This discovery changed my relationship with God. But my guess is that some of you right now are saying, yeah, but wait a second, Tim, we, we, are, we are called to serve God. Yes, indeed, we are. But what does that mean? Does that mean that we're supposed to give God an extra hand? Because God needs our help? No. Just as we heard in Acts 17, Paul says, 
God is not served by human hands as if God needed anything. For he himself gives people life and breath and everything else. God doesn't need us. If we end up working for God as if God needs us, we can end up thinking that God owes us. Thinking that God is indebted to us and, and better hold up his side of the bargain. We might think, you know, now I'm doing this for you, God, and uh, you better return the favor one day. We may not say that out loud, but that may be our motivation for serving. But according to scripture, serving God doesn't mean we meet God's needs. Serving God means God is the one we need and want more than anything. And so we orient our life around God and let God call the shots. We give God absolute authority in our lives because we know that God is out for our best. The God revealed to us in Jesus is a God who serves. And according to scripture, we are made in the image of God, which means we are made to serve. We are made to serve. Just as birds are made to fly, we are made to serve. Serving is how we honor God and bless others. Serving is how we live at our call to be God's image bearers in the world. On this All Saints Day, as we celebrate the, the saints in our church and beyond who have gone home to God, we remember all of the ways that they served. The ways they served their family, their loved ones. The ways they served our church. The ways they served their community. We are richer, we are blessed because of their service. And we stand here today as a church doing ministry because of all of those who before us have gone and served and the legacy of serving that they've left. As Winston Churchill stated, we make a living by what we get. We make a life by what we give. Nicholas Kristof, a, a columnist for the New York Times, wrote an article in which he posed this question. Which of these two people would you rather be? Richard is an ambitious 36-year-old white commodities trader who lives in Hawaii. He is healthy. He is handsome. He lives alone in a house with a pool. He has dated a series of gorgeous women. His job is stressful, but he spent Christmas in Tahiti. He has free time to indulge in passions like reading and running marathons and writing poetry. Lorna is a 64-year-old African-American woman who lives in North Dakota. She's overweight. She's on regular dialysis, but that does not impede her social life or babysitting with her grandchildren. She's a retired school assistant, very close to her 67-year-old her husband and is highly respected in their church for directing music ministries and leading semi-annual blood drives. Lorna believes in tithing and in the last few days has organized a church drive to raise $10,000 for overseas earthquake relief. So which of these two would be held up in our society as living the good life? Richard or Lorna? Which of these two is more likely to be happy? Richard or Lorna? See, as it turns out, based on extensive research in this field, Lorna is more likely to be happy. According to Jonathan Haidt, a psychology professor at the U uh, University of Virginia, happiness isn't tied to looks or lifestyle or location, but happiness is tied to serving others. It's tied to being generous with your finances, volunteering with others to make a difference, working with others on a cause larger than yourself. 
Joy is found in serving others. And that's exactly what Jesus calls us to do. After washing his disciples' feet, Jesus says to them, Now that I have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. If I, as I have set an example for you, that you should do as I have done. Now that I have served you, you are to serve one another. Connect, grow, serve. Jesus calls us to serve. So how do we serve in the midst of a pandemic? That's not a rhetorical question. That's an honest question that I'm asking right now. A question that no one has the answer to. A question that we need to discern and, and figure out together. How do we serve in the midst of a pandemic? I want to invite you to share your thoughts, your responses to that question in the comments on Facebook Live. Now, as I've been thinking about that question, here's one thought that, uh, that struck me this week. This pandemic has forced us to ask a huge question that has been in play for many years now. What role does the church building play in how we do church today? Big question, right? Look at what streaming has done to cable TV. Look at what Amazon has done to shopping centers. Look at what our digital world has done to how we communicate and connect with each other. Which raises the question, are churches behaving like malls in the age of Amazon? Are we still tied to, to brick and mortar buildings when the world around us no longer is? I know I am. <laughs> That's because I love our campus. I love our sanctuary. We're standing in it right now. I love our fellowship hall. It's a voting center right now. I love our, our senior high room, the hub, the newly remodeled kitchen, the children's center. I could go on. I love the, the, the ministry that happens on our campus and through our campus. Mm, but here's my thought. I'm wondering if for some of us, serving for the church is tied to serving at the church. In fact, the two have become one. So that the way I serve for the church is by serving at the church, which means now that I can't serve at the church, I'm not sure how to serve for the church. Th does that resonate with anyone? You're no longer serving like you were because nothing's happening at our church campus. See, this is one of my biggest concerns about the pandemic. That those who were serving are now sidelined. Not out of choice, but out of circumstance. That some of our ministry teams have been furloughed. Pastor Ken and I are not called to do the work of ministry. We're called, according to Paul in Ephesians 4, we're called to equip the saints, you all, for the work of ministry. We are called to empower you to serve. We are called to unleash your time, your gifts and skills, your financial resources for the sake of God's kingdom. I mean, we have so many amazing people in our church. We have so many gifted, talented people who can serve in ways that I could only dream of. During this pandemic, we need all of us in the game. Not on the sidelines but in the game. So some of us may need to ask, how do I serve for the church when I can no longer serve at the church? The possibilities are endless. The possibilities are exciting. 
and together we're learning what those possibilities are. And I love just hearing and seeing different ways that you all are serving right now. I know there are so many ways you're serving creatively, creatively and, and, and sacrificially. Ways that you all are washing one another's feet, as Jesus calls us to do. So during this month of November, I want to invite you to reflect on three questions. These three questions. In 2021, how will I serve with my time? How will I serve with my gifts and skills? And how will I serve with my finances? I want to invite you to reflect on these three questions. And there's great value in doing that, in reflecting, even if your answer right now is, I'm not sure. This pandemic has disrupted the way we serve. And so we need to be open to the new ways that God is calling us to serve and to do so knowing that, that, that serving brings joy both to God and to us. Albert Schweitzer once said, the only really happy people are those who have learned how to serve. See, and, and that makes sense if we're made in the image of God. For is God the Son who said, I came not to be served, but to serve? Amen. This morning, we're going to receive communion together. And at the, at the communion table, we see so clearly and beautifully how God serves us. At the communion table, we see how far Jesus went, how much Jesus sacrificed in order to serve us. And so I want to invite you, uh, if you've not yet done so, to have elements prepared before you. Some, a bread or some starch and a cup as we enter into this time of communion. Let's pray as we do so. God, we know this is doing communion in a different way. We've been doing this for several months now, but I just want to pray that your Holy Spirit would be very present. Jesus, we believe that you're present in, a, in this meal in a way we do not fully understand. That though we cannot see you, you meet us here. And so we invite your Holy Spirit to meet us as we come to this communion table. Amen. The Lord be with you. And, and also with you. We lift up, lift up your hearts. We lift, lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which Jesus gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. I invite you now to join me in lifting the bread or whatever starch that you have before uh, there in your home, wherever you're worshiping with us, just to lift this up to God. Body of Christ given for us. And when the supper was over, Jesus took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. I invite you now to join me in lifting up the cup.
blood of Christ given for us. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ is died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Please pray with me. Pour out your Holy Spirit, God, on us gathered throughout this state and this world. And God, we pray that you would pour out your Holy Spirit on the gifts of bread and cup that are before each of us. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. I invite you now, if you are uh, alone, uh, to simply receive these communion elements as you receive God's very love and grace. And if you're with others, to serve each other as a way of blessing and extending God's grace to one another. Let us now partake in these communion elements. Please pray with me. God, thank you that you model for us what it means to serve. Thank you that you are the greatest servant in the world. And your ultimate act of service was to come, to become one, one of us in Jesus Christ. And to lay down your very life. Jesus, you died for us that we may live, that we may be free from sin and death, that we may be free from all the brokenness, all the messed upness of our world. There's so much that is wrong with our world, and yet you took all of that upon yourself on the cross. And in baptism, we die with you, that we may rise with you into your newness of life that we may be set free to serve others even as you have served us. So we receive this grace and ask that you would empower us as we have been served by you to go out and serve others. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for the cross. In Jesus' name, amen. Our closing hymn today is number 581 from the United Methodist hymnal, Lord, whose love through humble service.
got a text last night from a friend who's very anxious. Anxious about this election. Anxious about the rising COVID cases in our nation. This is a crazy week we're stepping into. And our world needs true servants. Our world needs people who serve others, who put the needs of others before their own. Our world needs to see what God is like through us. So as we go from here into this week, let us go knowing that God serves us and that being made in God's image, we are called to serve. Let us serve one another. And as we do, may the love of God, the grace of Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be ours now and forevermore. Amen.